velocity equals. Change in x over change in t. Delta x is also known as Miss Hong. Displacement. Delta x change in what is x? Uh, length. It's not the length, actually. Heaven. Position. So delta x, the displacement, is technically the delta the change in position of an object. We can also talk about acceleration. What is the equation for acceleration in? Or change in velocity over change in time. Change in velocity over change in time. UAM stands for what, Daniela? Uniformly accelerated motion. Class, there are how many UAM variables? Five. There are how many UAM equations? Four. If you know how many variables, Three. you can figure out how many of the other two. two. And then at least this leaves you with one. Happy, Happy physics student. Oh, yeah. Uniformly accelerated motion. We just went through it. I'm not going to write down all four equations. You have them written down in all sorts of different places. In order to use the UAM equations, wicked, what must be true? Um, um. I'm going to take a moment to remind everyone that this is a review of all of the stuff you uh, knew at one point in this class. Chances are good that you probably don't remember all of it right now, and that's okay. That's why we're doing the review. So Wicked, it's okay. But understand that the reason we're reviewing is because when it comes to the final exam, which is uh, Tuesday, not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after, please be aware you do need to know this stuff. Wicked. Constant acceleration. In other words, the acceleration equals a number. That's what uniformly accelerated motion means. It means the acceleration is uniform. The concept of free fall. Tell me about free falling. Um, when an object is accelerating at a constant, it's constant rate. True. We know that constant rate, and we know under what under what circumstances it will be accelerating at that constant rate. Uh, we, I need a little bit more than that, Laura. In a vacuum, you can breathe. Okay. It has to be in the vacuum that you can breathe. True. What else, David? Nothing else can be touching it. True. And therefore, we know the acceleration grammar is equal to what? Uh, negative G. Negative G. The acceleration of the y direction equals negative G. Where G class is equal to what? Give me the whole thing, class. Positive or negative? Positive. Are you positive? Yes. You better be. G is a positive 9.8 meters per second squared. And yes, the acceleration in the y direction equals negative g. One thing to remember about free fall is uh, one of those hidden variables, which is the velocity at the top, one of those hidden knowns. The velocity at the top is equal to zero. It changes direction at the very top. Projectile motion. One of the issues with the final exam, unlike the quiz you just took, is that you need to better be able to identify what problems you should be, what equations you should be using for what problem. For example, you just took a quiz that was on chapter 12, sections one through four, so you knew every problem on that quiz would have something to do with that section. When you take this final exam and you are approaching a problem, you need to be able to say, oh, I know why I'm going to be using this set of equations for this problem. Projectile motion. What is it about a problem that says, ah, I can use the projectile motion approach? Mitch. Um, is it a tree bump? 
it is in free fall, but there's more to it than just that. Uh, Sam? Um, there's probably usually like an X and a Y direction. It's going, flying through the vacuum that you can breathe in both the X and Y direction. If it's only in the Y direction, it's only free fall. But if it's moving in both the X and the Y direction, you have to use the projectile motion approach. What is the approach from using projectile motion? Um, Michelle? Go. You have to list what you know in the x direction and list what you know in the y direction. What do we know is always true about the motion in the y direction? Yeah. About the y direction. Yep. We know the acceleration in the y direction is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Therefore, we can use the UAM equations in the y direction. What about the x direction, Lily? Um, you would use what you found in the y direction. Yeah. Like the uh, not necessarily. Sometimes we'll start with the x direction. But what is always true for the x direction, Emma? Um, acceleration is constant. The ex true, but the acceleration actually was constant in the y direction, right? Velocity. It's a constant velocity. Because the acceleration in the x direction is equal to zero, we can use the equation for a constant velocity. Velocity in the x direction equals delta x over delta t. Whenever we're solving a projectile motion problem, Knickerbocker, we're solving for one of the variables which we're going to use in the other direction. What is that variable? Sure, whenever we're doing projectile motion, we are starting with one of the two directions. We're solving it finding a variable and applying that to the other direction. All of the time. Time. Why is it that delta t is the same in both the x and the y direction in projectile motion? Because it's Bless. Bless. Um, scalar. It's a scalar. Delta t is a scalar, which brings us to the concept of a vector versus a scalar. What is the difference between a vector and a scalar? Leah? Um, I believe a vector has um, like a constant or Ah, uh, that's not a complete answer. Good one. A vector has a direction and a magnitude. Yeah. Yeah. Scalar is just a magnitude. Yeah. A scalar has only magnitude, whereas a vector has both magnitude and direction. So that's why in projectile motion, delta t you can use in both the x and y direction because it does not have a direction. All of the other UAM variables are vectors and can, are not going to be applicable in both directions. So you need to remember what objects, what uh, variables are vectors and which ones are scalars. When you, um, so when doing projectile motion. Uh, there are some special cases that I do want to talk about. What if the initial velocity is neither directly in the x direction or the y direction? It's at some uh, theta to the horizontal, for example, Mitch. You need to figure out the components of the initial velocity. First, list velocity initial in the x direction, velocity initial in the y direction. Uh, you find, need to find components. Just like if you're doing vector addition, where you are then going to use the concept of so ha, ha, to break vectors into components and redraw vector diagrams and do vector addition. So when you're doing, when you have an initial velocity vector not at the um, in the x or y direction, you break it into its components. Then you have the initial velocity in the x direction, the y direction. You can move forward from there. We also have other special cases. For example, when is it that the velocity initial in the y direction is equal to zero in projectile motion? Christina, when can we say the initial velocity in the y direction is equal to zero in projectile motion? Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to start at your hand. It could, but I want the general statement. Why is it? When is it that we can say the initial velocity in the y direction is equal to zero? Come. Say again? When you're 
That would be true for just free fall, but we're talking about projectile motion. So that would, just dropping something actually would not cause projectile motion. Um, Andrew? Isn't what it's coming off of flat surface? It's coming off of flat surface is an example, but why is it that when an object is coming off of a flat surface, the initial velocity in the y direction is equal to zero? Nick? The peak that is being made velocity. I agree that velocity in the y direction at the very peak is going to be equal to zero. That's something different than what we're talking about right here. We have an example, the, a Coming off of a table, a sphere will have an initial velocity in the y direction of equal to zero. But what is it about that motion that will cause that initial velocity in the y direction to be equal to zero? Wicked. Um, if it like starts on a table, the table is keeping it from falling. We're so close, but I want because it doesn't have to necessarily be a table. We've had other examples, and I want to make sure we understand why we. It starts like horizontal. If that initial velocity is completely horizontal, which is why it works for the table, though it does not going to work for every table, however, because um, it, you could have a table that is inclined. So as long as the initial velocity is horizontal, you can then say that the initial velocity in the y direction is going to be equal to zero. We also have for projectile motion something called the range equation. Range is equal to velocity initial squared times the sine of two theta divided by g. Remember, when you use this equation, you do not break the initial velocity into its components. This is the one example for doing projectile motion where you do not. But when can we use the range equation? Andy? Um, when it starts at the, like, there's no displacement in the y direction. When the overall displacement in the y direction is equal to zero, it starts and ends at the same height. It goes up, it comes down. It lands at the same height. That's when you can use the range equation. The force of friction. What is the general equation, Jessica, for the force of friction? General equation for the force of friction. Cosi, help her out. Oh, okay. Mu times the force normal. Mu times the force normal. How do you spell mu? Yeah. Ah, uh, mu. Jump. M U. It's a good Scrabble word. M U. When you're trying to figure out how to play that Q, sometimes you can put it off, play it off of a U with an M. Anyway, uh, mu stands for what? Stecker. The name of mu. Jessica, help her out. Uh, the coefficient of friction. Meredith, what are the dimensions of the coefficient of friction? There are none. There are none. It is dimensions. The coefficient of friction. We can have two different kinds of coefficient of friction. Stecker, what are those? Yes. Static and kinetic. Static friction and kinetic friction. What are the differences between static and kinetic friction, Danielle? Um, static is non-moving. Like static is non-moving friction. Kinetic is. kinetic is moving friction. What are reasonable values for the coefficients of friction, Connie? It's a minimum and kind of a maximum, a range for it. <coughs> Zero is the minimum. Well, you can actually have it higher than one, um, maybe one and a half, maybe even up to two and a half or something like that, but under extreme course circumstances. Good. We have all the different forces there. Ah, speaking of the force of friction, please remind me there are three th different things I asked you to, to remember about the direction of the force of friction. Grimmer, give me one. Direction of the force of friction. I need to know different things that I told you to remember to figure out the direction of the force of friction. It opposes motion. Number one, it opposes motion. Another one? Andrew? I'm sorry, Leah, go ahead. Parallel to the surface. It's parallel to the surface. And Andrew? 
this one is less. What is the more less about the direction of it, and more about like, something that you guys often confuse, having to do with the force, the direction, of force, direction. It's not a push. Ah, that's uh, that's that's the, that's the force normal. We'll get there in a minute. Um, Sam, help him out. Ah, uh, it's that's. It doesn't have to be a positive well, I direction. It. That's what no, it does not. No, that's okay, Dave. It does not have to do with the direction of the force applied, so it's independent of the force applied. Okay, we have the force normal. What does the word normal mean? Um, the force exerted by a surface. I agree the force normal is the force exerted by a surface, but that is not what the word normal means. Danielle. Um, I don't remember if it means parallel or perpendicular. It is, you are correct. It is one of those two. Which one? Cross? Perpendicular. It is perpendicular to the surface. The other thing you need to remember about the direction of the force normal is perpendicular to the surface and Nikola. Always a push. A surface cannot pull, so it is always a push. We have all of those. Okay, so if you are working with forces, we have five easy steps for working with forces. Step one, weekly, is draw a free body diagram. After you have drawn the free body diagram, Mario, break any necessary vectors into their components. Ah, that was, oh, that's, that's the problem. Break any vectors that are not in the x or y direction into their components. After you have broken necessary vectors into components, what should you do next? Andrew? Uh, redraw the free body diagram. Redraw the free body diagram. Step four, Christina. Solve. How? <laughs> I don't think step four is going to be fine, whatever you need to find. Sorry. Uh, wicked. <laughs> Sum the forces in one direction, that's equal to mass times the acceleration. What is step five? Mitch? Sum the forces in the other direction. Sum the forces in the other direction. Note the redundancy in four and five, they are not actually redundant. You're summing the forces in one direction and then the other direction. For example, the x and the y direction, or rather if you are on an incline, Cosi, what direction are you going to sum the forces in? Um, the parallel the perpendicular direction. Please recall if you have an incline that force of gravity is broken into the force of gravity parallel and the force of gravity perpendicular to the 